Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I know a lot of you here in this room, but for those of you with whom I have not had the pleasure of a conversation, um, my name is Susan McTiernan, and I have the great pleasure of serving as Dean of the Gabelli School of Business here at Roger Williams University. And I want to extend to all of you, um, particularly alumni and parents, a very warm welcome to this presentation of the Student Managed Investment Fund, otherwise known as the CAFE. Uh, we are very proud of this group of students for how hard they work and their performance in investing. I have many weeks when I walk by and talk with them and hear what they're doing and want to write them a check myself, but I'm not allowed to do that. Um, but you'll hear more from them today about um, their extraordinary work, their very hard work, um, and their capacity for making good decisions in real time, which is what they do every day uh, and every hour pretty much in the CAFE program. So um, I don't want to delay any further. I'll have some comments a little bit later at the end of the program. But I know they're anxious to get started and that we're very anxious to hear from them. So I'd like to introduce to you Janetta Griffin, who is the Managing Director of the Student Managed Investment Fund. Janetta, yes. I will let you take thank this you. over. Thank you Good so luck much. to all of you. Yeah, thank you. So my name is Janetta Griffin, and I am the Managing Director of the CAFE. And I would like to welcome you all to this semester's final presentation. And in doing so, thank you all to the CAFE alumni as well for being here to celebrate the CAFE's 15 year anniversary. This is fabulous. And in doing so, I would like to invite Mr. Guthrie Carpenter up, a CAFE alumni, as well as CAFE advisory board member to speak on behalf of the board. Thanks, Janetta. Thank you all for coming. Uh, you know, this, this program really is near and dear to me. Um, you know, so I appreciate you all coming down on the 15th anniversary. That's pretty incredible. I'd like to start by first introducing the CAFE Advisory Board. If you guys could stand. That's too much. <laughs> <laughs> These individuals, um, as long as myself. <laughs> we work on everything from performance and risk, uh, mentoring students, to generating funds. Uh, for the program, you know, it's really important to continue to drive for the future growth. So, you know, again, thank you all for coming. It's, uh, you know, it's it's a commitment, and it's worth it. You know, for this kind of program. Um, in addition, here are 65 other people who donate to the cafe. We were able to raise roughly $5,900. I think that's pretty incredible. I think that that deserves a round of applause. One of the most important facets of this program specifically is our ability to maintain relationships to be able to create that bond and none of this would have been possible without Doc. If you could go to the next slide actually. Um, here are some clips uh, minus the embarrassing one on the bottom left. <laughs> <laughs> past presentations and as I can say you know from past experience you put in long hours, you make lasting friendships, we go on incredible trips and there is nothing like being a part of this program. You know, myself included, being here, it is stressful, for sure. You know, and you spend a lot of time, but at the end of the day, we are all better off in our careers, as well as, as our lives. Thank you, Zachary. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. So I'll turn the floor back over to Janetta for what we all came to see. Thank you all. Well, um, and just to continue a little bit more off of that, this presentation is really special because we recognize that Roger Williams' current focus is on experiential learning. And 15 years ago, our founding director, Dr. Michael Melton, was truly at the forefront of such a concept. By creating this environment that mimicked industry to a T, from the long hours, financial reporting, professional dress, and even the way that we're treated, all of the tasks of the student fund managers truly replicate industry. And I would like them all to introduce themselves. My name is Lucas Watt. I was an industrials, real estate, consumer staples, and utilities analyst. I'm Bob McGinnis. I was a financials and real estate analyst. Dean Cascaris. I was a sector analyst for energy, materials, and consumer discretionary. Cameron Gass, consumer staples, real estate, utilities, and industrials analyst. Paolo Moj, I was a healthcare, technology, and communication service analyst. Edmund Geschechter, financials, energy, materials, and consumer discretionary analyst. Jay Cogren, healthcare, technology, and communication services analyst. Mike Waldo, technology, healthcare, and comm services analyst. Kyle Leach, industrials, staples, and reads analyst. Ashley Klimchak, analyst for consumer discretionary, final, uh, finance, energy, and math. 
And since 2004, when the very first group of student fund managers was selected, there's been a various and vast difference in market conditions, from a bull market to a bear market, many corrections and even a crash. The one thing that truly remains constant across all of these groups is the process. But don't get me wrong, as I learned really early on, each group has their own particular identity and their own way of accomplishing tasks. But the one thing that comes up at the end of every semester, it's that each group of student fund managers have gone through the same process and focused on the one goal at hand to generate alpha. The CAFE Portfolio Management Program differs in so many ways from that of other universities. We have the unique opportunity to manage two portfolios with two differing objectives. And as many of the alumni in attendance today know, the one thing that remains constant from semester to semester is the process. And given our two different funds and their differing objectives, this allows student fund managers to use both their qualitative and their quantitative skills to find not only what a stock can do for us today and tomorrow, but from 2020 and beyond. Now in our growth fund, we're looking for what a stock can do for us right now, meaning over the course of this semester and until the end of summer 2019 when the new group has a chance to reallocate the holdings. This puts a major focus on a more active management strategy as we are looking for immediate growth. Here as analysts, we place an emphasis on key growth metrics, an increase in earnings per share, quarter over quarter, and year over year, as well as any potential earnings plays. For growth, behavioral news can be a major driver in a stock's performance, as well as using technical analysis to find the optimal buy and sell time to maximize the return of each of our holdings. On the other hand, for our value fund, we look at what the company can do for us in the long term. This is more of a passive strategy where we incorporate a company-focused approach, seeking those catalysts that will drive success in the long term. Key valuation metrics, such as EV over EBITDA, can help us find if a company is truly beaten down, and models, such as discounted cash flows, help us find the worth for the next three to five years. A value holding must show strength in its cash flows, with a trend that's increasing at an increasing rate. Once cash flows are in line, we then look for any potential drivers that will increase a company's earnings growth in the future. No matter what our time horizon or our objective, we are able to generate alpha in our two funds due to our weighting scheme, which is derived from our top-down analysis. And regardless of the time frame, the core of our analysis is that top-down approach. It's through this analysis that we're able to identify trends in both current and forecasted economies, domestic and abroad. Now this was my favorite part of the cafe and has led to Doc referring to me as a macroeconomist. We seek to find economic catalysts that will make certain sectors outperform over others. Then we dig deeper to find those industries within each sector that will perform well. Finally. We invest in fundamentally strong companies that are not only performing well in the short term, but will experience continued growth moving forward. A good example of this is our overweight position in the energy sector, supported by rising oil prices in the short term, which will slate upstream drillers and midstream oil transport companies to outperform. We also anticipated that heavily levered sectors like industrials would benefit from the stable interest rate environment. As the cost of borrowing stabilizes, it's easier for customers, and companies especially, to maintain their debt. This might let them bring on more debt. We also inherited a really strong labor market coming into the semester, which we expected to boost discretionary income and consumer spending, justifying our overweight position in the growth fund in the consumer discretionary sector. But in sectors with more poor short-term outlook like real estate, we seek to identify industries that will perform regardless. With increased federal spending, and more consumer sentiment regarding the 5G movement, we thought tower providers was the place to go. Crown Castle International is one of our holdings and a real estate investment trust that operates within this 5G network. Moving into the long term, we acknowledge that the future is very unpredictable. And for that reason, we compose a value fund that will stand the test of time. For example, in the value fund, you'll notice that we underrated the technology sector because we're looking for more sustainable dividend growth rather than immediate price appreciation. And this immediate price appreciation can be seen on the chart behind me. This is the sector rotation chart, and it plots the performance of all sectors on a weekly basis from year to date. Now, looking up high at the technology sector, we could see that they're more pricey, but we're okay with that in some senses. Yeah, that green streak at the top that Bob just mentioned shows the incredible run of technology so far year to date. But we can also see some other good stories from this semester including the yellow line right below tech, which is the good run of industrials until Boeing's troubles derailed the sector. Almost a reverse mirror image of technology is the red line trailing off the bottom of the chart, and that's healthcare. And it's no secret that healthcare has been pretty beaten up year to date. This is largely due to the behavioral factors regarding the sector. 
Anyways, we, we still held market weight in this sector, uh, and that's because of the confidence we have in those underlying holdings that Pat's going to be really excited to tell you about later. Momentum metrics like this sector rotation model help us to identify where we are in the business cycle and what sectors will lead as a result. Now going back to technology and that PE ratio deal, we wanted to show that on this chart. Now because investors really enjoy technology stocks and investing in them, when the sentiment increases, so does the price. The thing about tech stocks is that they're really growthy, but that's not always shown in current earnings. Because of that, they usually have higher PE ratios in the market. For this reason, while technology stocks may be really great for our growth fund, they're not as good for our value fund. Now, going back to the macroeconomic sense, we understand that the U.S. is facing more competition from abroad. Regardless of this, we still found ample opportunity to invest overseas. Top Down helps us pile our funds into those industries and sectors that will perform well, no matter what stocks we pick, though we do try to pick the greatest stocks in the world. A correct weighting scheme based on current economic conditions is what truly drives our funds to consistently outperform the market. Now to begin our discussion regarding the performance, we first had to analyze our fund's raw return compared to that of the market and their competitors. As you can see on the two charts behind me in our growth fund, we actually outperformed not only the S&P 500, but almost all of our, our competitors. Where in the value fund, we underperformed the S&P 500, but outperformed almost all of our competitors. And this is outstanding news, but because we're in the cafe and we mirror industry, what we focus on is our risk-adjusted returns, and to do that, we must first analyze our fund's risk characteristics. So far this semester, we've experienced a bull market with the S&P 500 breaking through multiple levels of resistance. Although there's constant risk of a market pullback, therefore, we've minimized our systematic risk with a beta of 0.92 in our growth fund and 0.75 in our value fund. It's important to keep in mind that although our markets have ran here to date, not every day is, a, is an up day. Year to date, we have seen year to date we have seen 77 trading days, and out of those 77 trading days, we have seen 51 up days, but we have also seen 26 down days as well. From the chart, you can see that on average, our two funds do slightly underperform the market on up days. However, this is because of the risk characteristics used to gain alpha through down days to preserve wealth. You can also see a clear difference between our two funds' valuation multiples. The PE forward for a growth fund is 21.69 compared to that of the value fund at 19.06. To continue on with the comparisons, you can see that our dividend yield in our growth fund is just over 1% compared to that of our value fund, which is at 2.41% for more steady income. Looking behind me, you can see that our growth fund has outperformed the S&P 500 on a raw basis while continuously maintaining a beta of less than one. You can also see that our value fund slightly underperforms the S&P 500 However, to measure how successful these funds are, we take into account risk-adjusted performance. And as you can see by our Sharpe ratio, we manage our total risk well, outperforming the market in both our growth and value funds. The Sharpe ratio states that for every one unit of risk we take on, we are receiving 1.22 units of reward in our growth fund and 1.16 in our value, which is greater than the S&P 500. When taking into account our systematic risk, you can see that we've outperformed the market in both our, in both our growth and our value fund with a risk-adjusted return of 2.17% in growth and 1.51% in value. Now you can clearly see the difference between both our value and our growth funds through our risk characteristics and valuation multiples. Now we've been able to garner these returns through the specific analysis techniques that we use to choose great holdings as well as our various weighting schemes that was discussed. And now that we've presented our process as well as our performance year to date, the student fund managers are going to continue this discussion about the analyses that we use to create these holdings. For six of the 11 sectors, however, a listing of all of our holdings can be seen on your fact sheets and your folders. The discussion will start with information technology. So in the short term, technology stocks offer a lot of growth potential with their continuous modernization as well as the products and services that we rely on so heavily. We expect industries such as semiconductors, IT services, as well as hardware to be the drivers in the near future due to their extremely competitive nature. However, in the long term, a vast majority of technology holdings do not fit a value fund objective due to their run-up nature, inconsistent, inconsistent cash flows, and a lack of dividend. Therefore, in our growth fund, we have overweighted tech at 22.5%, where in our value fund, we have underweighted tech at just 18%. As Bob stated earlier, over the past semester, behavioral news has been a clear driver in many sectors. 
including technology. And given the culture of Silicon Valley's research and development to use rounds of funding, we moved our main focus in technology to be all about the behavioral, which is my favorite analysis technique. Now, Levi, we'd like to thank you for taking a step away from your Xbox to come see us today. And we know you'll love this company, Logitech. Logitech is a growth holding of ours due to its commanding presence in a high growth industry. Logitech is a gaming peripherals company that makes items such as headsets, keyboards, mice, and more for gamers and everyday computer users alike. Like I said, Logitech is a gaming peripherals company, and this segment is growing rapidly. In 2018, it grew 15% to $7.5 billion in revenue, with Logitech being responsible for 37% of that revenue. Now, this presence and growth is expected to continue, especially with the recent acquisition of Astro Gaming, a gaming headset company and one of its biggest rivals. And if you look at the graph behind me, you can see eSports graphed Logitech's revenues, and you can see in 2020, they are both expected to explode. Even with their recent acquisition of Astro Gaming and their constant rollout of new products, Logitech has been able to maintain a balance sheet with zero debt. This allows them the flexibility to make future purchases in an extremely fast-paced industry. Their 8.29% HPY in just four weeks is the type of price appreciation we as growth investors look to capitalize on. Now moving to value, we look for a company that has exposure to the tech sector, but one that displays the safety that's rarely found within it. Corning was founded in 1938 and is now a leader in 5G optical fibers, as well as displays for TVs, phones, and tablets. It is, a, it is an innovator in multiple technologies, ranging from foldable phone screens to ceramic car exhaust filters. Corning is poised for long-term value. Multiple contracts extending through 2023 with some of the largest names in technology, such as Samsung, LG, HTC, Google, and most importantly, BlackBerry. Even with these large contracts, they have almost doubled the net margins of their two closest competitors and have 95% of the market share. With, all this, with this vast list of products, we can expect them to continue growing into the future. In their fiber optic segment, Corning sells the largest 4G and 5G providers in the world, including China Mobile, AT&T, Verizon, and Vodafone. In multiple business segments, Corning doesn't fight for market share. They are the market. Corning holds the highest weight of our value fund tech holdings because we as analysts believe in its futures due to its consistent contract renewals and its innovative mindset. And we have been able to capitalize on growth in the technology sector, even with their expensive valuations, especially when compared to least favorable sectors. Next, we'd like to talk about a sector that I've had the privilege of working with for the entire semester, healthcare. Although I have thoroughly enjoyed my time as a healthcare analyst, I haven't necessarily loved how it's been performing. We have a moderately bearish outlook in the short term, considering a sector that's had minimal returns year to date in a bull market, stagnating earnings projections, and a large impact from legislation driving the sector downwards. With that being said, we are at market weight in our growth fund. Although we're bearish in the sector as a whole, we are bullish on our individual holdings and their ability to capitalize on growth opportunities. An example of this would be Zoetis, one of our holdings in the growth fund in healthcare that's returned 18% thus far in a sector that's been severely beaten down. We're really proud of this holding. Our outlook over the long term is also mildly bearish, hence our underweight position. With the sector's forward profit margins that are expected to decline, as well as the sector G prime of only 0.4%, we do not see healthcare being a driver for our fund in the future. Even given our bearish outlook on the sector as a whole, we are very confident in our holdings, such as Soetis, a healthcare company in the pharmaceutical industry that develops, manufactures, and commercializes medicine and vaccines for livestock and companion animals worldwide. Every sector requires a slight variation of analysis, but with healthcare, fundamental analysis is very important. Healthcare kind of faces threats as a whole, considering recent legislations that have uh, targeted inflated drug costs, for example. When we invest in a fundamentally sound healthcare company, we don't necessarily have to worry about these threats. So what is separates itself from the competition and solidifies itself as a strong company on growth fund due to its fundamental metrics. The company is incredibly liquid and has plenty of cash on hand, even after its most recent acquisition of Avaxis. They also boast the strongest return on asset, return on invested capital, and return on common equity in the industry and against their direct competitor, Merck. And if you look at the growth rate of Zoetis, along with their risk characteristics, this holding screens growth, comparatively to their competitor, Merck, which has low risk characteristics and favorable value metrics, which is why we do hold it in our value fund. Zoetis has seen incredible growth in their cash flows in the last two years. They produce superior products and services for your companion animals, a major driving force in their revenue segments, ultimately being reflected in their cash flows, as you can see behind me. Zoetis has also shown superb strength in their earnings, hitting for the last 11 quarters while showing a positive price reaction in eight of those quarters. With a value line's earning predictability score of 90 and stock price stability of 85, this just helps solidify why Zoetis is perfect for our growth fund. 
We've invested in Zoetis due to the many underlying reasons we've discussed here. But one thing to be clear, this was not an earnings play. When investing in Zoetis, we did realize fiscal year quarter four earnings was right around the corner. After further analysis, we felt confident holding Zoetis going into earnings, which proved to be correct. They realized a 5% price appreciation. After this, we then grew more bullish on Zoetis, increasing their weight to become the number one weighted healthcare company in the growth fund. As I previously mentioned, they've capitalized on 18% return thus far in a sector that's been very beaten down. This just really shows their ability to capitalize on growth in a sector that may not be so favorable. Similar to healthcare, financials has also failed to offer market beating growth so far this year. But this wasn't actually the case for the first part of the semester. In fact, for the first half of it, financials was actually outperforming the S&P 500. One of the reasons that I love being a financials analyst is because of its close connection to monetary policy. And we got good experience dealing with a significant change to the interest rate outlook halfway through the semester, which pegged it to underperform after such a hot start. On March 20th, the Federal Reserve announced that they would likely not raise rates for the rest of the year. This was detrimental to the financial sector, who can increase revenues and net interest margins from those increasing costs of borrowing. For these reasons, we had to reevaluate our sector weights, especially in banking. On March 21st, we actually cut weight in our growth holding, PNC. PNC is a regional bank that derives most of its revenue from banking. Negative catalyst that Bob just discussed to earlier really altered our short-term outlook on this company. Instead, we shifted our focus to other industries such as consumer finance, where we hold Synchrony Financial, a creditor that has partnered with, went, excuse me, with many well-known retailers such as Amazon, Lowe's, Gap, and even Walmart. But we don't expect interest rates to stay this low forever. For that reason, we didn't have to cut a lot of weight in our value holding, J.P. Morgan Chase. We think that JPM is a driver in its industry and will continue to perform over the longer time horizon of this fund. Although this analysis led us to keep our weight relatively consistent in JPM, we truly understand the value this company actually provides. JPM only derives roughly 46% of its revenue from banking. The company is also an investment bank, a creditor, and an asset manager. Another holding that we love to flaunt in financials is Chubb Limited. Chubb is one of the biggest names in insurance. They underwrite customers worldwide across a varied number of insurance types. Chubb operates in 54 countries across four continents. Now this allows them to diversify and pool all of this risk to minimize payout variance. For this reason, we're really bullish on the company. They've also never stopped growing and continue to acquire the competition. In the financial sector, a sector that has been plagued by low interest rates, we try to, excuse me, we try to mitigate this risk by diversifying across multiple sectors for not only short-term growth, but also long-term value. In contrast to the financial sector, the consumer discretionary sector has led the market here today. The consumer discretionary sector holds our largest discrepancy between waiting in our growth fund and waiting in our value fund. In the short term, we are more bullish on the sector, hence our overweighting of the growth fund by 1.82%. But in the long term, we are a little bit more cautious on the sector, shown by our underweighting in the value fund by 3.78%. This sector has returned more than 20% year to date. And because of this consistent growth and cyclicality, we decided to overweight it in the growth fund. We did the contrary in the value fund, making more room for safer sectors like consumer staples. The two companies best representing our consumer discretionary holdings are Home Depot in growth and Alta in value. When analyzing these two companies, we use economic data as well as strong fundamental analysis, both of which surpassed expectations. After identifying macroeconomic trends in home ownership, we decided to look deeper into the home improvement industry. We found Home Depot, a company that can better appeal to both homeowners and contractors and its direct competitor Lowe's. On the other hand, Alta derives its value characteristics from the recession-proof goods it produces. Makeup, as we all know, or as the boys have learned, has no substitute. This allows Alta to generate wider margins than the rest of the retail industry. Behind me, you will find a graph that compares consumer um, real cosmetic spending to real household spending. Uh, the stability of cosmetic spending juxtaposed to the greater market really proves its status as an inelastic product. Identifying growth in home improvement, we looked at Home Depot's financial statements and found consistency. We see that Home Depot is incredibly strong in the earnings department. The company has not missed on earnings in over two years and has consistently generated surprises to the upside. Learning how to analyze earnings is one of the most valuable concepts that I've taken here from the cafe. Not only is this company fundamentally strong, they offer a really promising business structure as well. This company has recently been inorganically growing by acquiring companies like US Homes and Blinds.com. 
This, in addition to their ability to cut less profitable segments of their stores, are two catalysts driving this company in an already growing industry. Now, Alta is a one-stop shop for all things cosmetics. This value firm understands their competitive advantage, harping on their tagline, all things beauty, all in one place. Alta sells everything from perfume to hair products to makeup. Although most brick and mortar stores have been experiencing decreased growth rates because of increasing e-commerce pressure, Amazon has had little effect on Alta. In recent years, the company has embraced the online movement. Alta CEO Mary Dillon recognizes the threat of online retail and has been expanding their e-commerce brand. When Mary Dillon became CEO in 2013, she really brought the company into the future with this e-commerce segment. The customer's ability to both go into the store, find a good they like, purchase it online, and receive loyalty benefits are two symbiotic sections of the company that drive revenues. The more you shop, the more points you can earn, which you can not only use on Alta's products, but also in its beauty salons. Alta's product stability, customer loyalty, and brand diversity are all reasons why it is here to stay. So we have presented to you a company that we have overweighted in our growth fund. Lucas will now talk to you a little bit more about a company that we have underweight, overweighted in our value fund. Contrary to consumer discretionary, in our consumer staples sector, we have decided to underweight it in our growth fund and overweight it in our value fund. The decision to underweight in our, in our growth fund is due to the lack of growth for the sector, but to bolster our returns, we decided to allocate this excess weight into more bullish sectors such as consumer discretionary or technology. In the value fund, we wanted to capitalize on the price stability and risk characteristics that these holdings demonstrate, and that's why we are currently overweight. One of our more unique holdings in our growth fund is Metafast. Now you may not have heard of this company, but they produce, distribute, and sell clinically proven weight management products. What makes them so unique is their incredible growth with an industry that averages negative 3.83% growth. Their focus on health-centric foods allows them to capture market share as people care more about what they put in their bodies. Metafast boasts increasing margins and an exceptional growth rate of 43.93%. Their attractive upside-downside ratio is greater than some of the largest and growthiest companies in the world and their growth rate is lined with our growth fund's objective to garner short-term capital gains. Now, as you can see behind me, the profitability ratios and share values that are, all, are exponentially increasing, yet when we looked at Metafast, their stock, their price chart was still very low, only 10 or 15 percent off their 52-week low. At that point, we believe that there was underlying growth within this company, and we're super excited to see almost a 20 percent return in less than three weeks. Now, Rarely is energy discussed in a cafe presentation, but rather than bore you guys with something like communication services, we'd like to highlight this extremely relevant sector. But to do so, I'm going to need you all to t put on your cowboy boots because we're going to the Permian Basin in Texas. In the energy sector, we understand that changes in oil prices are the main factor that will drive this sector's performance. Changes in supply and demand led us to conduct a thorough analysis to where we believe the future of this sector will be headed. Last semester, the CAFE held a minuscule weight in energy across both of their funds. And from October to December, oil prices collapsed, dropping roughly 40%, which greatly helped to justify their overall outlook. However, moving into this semester, OPEC held a meeting in December where they decided that cutting production would stabilize the market. Therefore, coming into the semester, we had a pretty good idea that oil prices would rise significantly. When oil prices rise, companies that are involved in exploration and production tend to benefit the most. The oil they are joined for is now more valuable and thus can be sold for a greater profit. We chose in particular to focus on these companies in the short term as we believe they would um, benefit from the short term price appreciation. So overall, we chose to overweight our energy holdings in our growth fund due to such a strong short term outlook. And the company that we really love in our growth fund that matches up with this short term outlook is Pro Petro Holding Corporation. ProPetro provides highly specialized hydraulic fracturing services to oil and gas companies operating out of the Permian Basin, a shale oil rich area of West Texas and New Mexico. Hydraulic fracturing is a technique used to gain these resources, to, to obtain these resources such as oil and natural gas that has been garnering a lot of popularity recently. This type of fracturing has been gaining this popularity because it can obtain these resources like oil and natural gas um, instead of using normal drilling operations per usual. As oil and gas companies in the Permian drill for more oil when these oil prices rise, their demand for ProPetro services also increases. And because of this, uh, we have seen that ProPetro has outperformed uh, this year, especially as uh, the 
due to the oil environment that we are currently in. Uh, we have seen almost a 25% HPY year, uh, in this holding and are extremely proud of it. To give you more of a visual representation of the stock's success, here you can see a six month price chart between crude oil and ProPetro. Clearly as crude oil has appreciated and stabilized throughout the semester, ProPetro has also increased as well. This is exactly the kind of exposure we want to see with our energy holdings and our growth fund. When shifting our focus to the long term for the value fund, we still have a very favorable outlook on the sector. However, we acknowledge that any long-term outlook in energy is subject to major fluctuations in oil prices. And for that reason, in the value fund, we decided to keep our weight a little bit more in line with the market. And to hedge against this volatility risk, we decided to focus on a different aspect of the energy chain and moved our attention to midstream energy companies, ones that own and operate pipelines and other infrastructure for the transportation of oil and natural gas. Thus, in our value fund, we chose enterprise product um, product partners. A company out of Houston, Texas that's a leader in this midstream energy industry. Enterprise represents a strong company in our value fund due to its increasing cash flows, 6% dividend yield that has been increasing for the past 15 years, and extremely low risk characteristics. When trying to find a strong value company to hold, we understand it takes a lot of research, not only for that company, but the industry specifically. This is my favorite part of the cafe. It's led to us finding a strong value company such as Enterprise that we'll, we believe will provide long-term value, not only for the sector, but our fund over the course of three to five years. It also shows strong competitive advantages relative to the rest of the industry because of the vast network of services and pipelines that it offers. When oil and gas companies are looking for somebody to transport their resources, they look for somebody like Enterprise. Additionally, Enterprise boasts a strong and sustainable dividend that has grown over the years, which sets it apart as a leader in the industry. In a stark contrast with one of its direct competitors, Kinder Morgan, Kinder Morgan actually had to slash their dividend payout in 2016 due to its unsustainability being paid out and also due to a crash in oil prices in 2016. But on the contrary, Enterprise actually increased their distribution to their investors in 2016. Enterprise also boasts $5.1 billion of projects in its backlog some of which are already generating revenue and cash flows for their operations today. They're also invested in the creation of export facilities to world markets. This has been an incredible demand due to the amount of supply that's coming out of the United States. We truly believe the future for this company just could not be brighter. Now that we have shown you a couple of the behavioral and fundamental analysis techniques that we use in the cafe, we would like to introduce a third technique that we use when trading, technical analysis. Technical analysis is a securities analysis technique in which investors will uh, focus on price patterns and technical indicators as a way to discern trends and make future predictions. And it is also a perfect example of what differentiates the CAFE from, other, from our peers due to the fact that we actually had to take a technical analysis course that is usually only provided at the graduate level. Behind me you'll see the five day chart for Metafast along with some relevant technical indicators. The first two the awesome and Arun oscillator. Now, oscillators are not complex. In fact, it's just the manipulation of uh, price or volume in order to create extreme values that become our oversold, overbought, or oversold territories. And these actually become our sell and buy signals. And following down the line, we then have the RSI, or Relative Strength Index, as following, followed by the MACD, or Moving Average Convergence Divergence Indicator. And we actually have a great example of how we use this a specific indicator to perfect to almost perfectly time a trade in uh, in energy, and then finally we have the ATR, the average true range. This is a unique indicator because unlike the oscillators, this looks at the undermining volatility to the asset and can help discern when there should be sharp price appreciation or depreciation, and can help hedge your bets or make profits. One move we'd like to show that really exemplifies our use of technical analysis in the cafe occurred when we decided that MPLX a midstream energy company that we once held in our growth fund was underperforming. So we decided to sell the company. We then went to our buy list and chose Cabot Oil and Gas, the company on your right. This company is a leader in the natural gas and oil industry and has extremely strong fundamentals that we believe will be a perfect fit for our growth fund. We then went to the chart to maximize our opportunity for when to buy in. And that's essentially what we did. As you can see behind me, MPLX demonstrated two strong recurring sell signals at around 12 p.m. Well, almost simultaneously, we saw two recurring buy signals from our potential sweep in Cabot Oil and Gas. We then decided to exit our position in MPLX based on these indicators at 12.13, 
and watched as the price depreciated throughout the remainder of the session. Whereas in our, uh, and then decided to enter into our other position in Cabot Oil and Gas at 12.16 p.m. and watched as the price saw an immediate point appreciation followed by appreciation throughout the remainder of the session. This just shows how different the CAFE is from other programs at the undergraduate level because we were able to execute this trade in a matter of just three minutes. Though we only use technical analysis to support predetermined trades, small decisive moves like this help us to garner tiny amounts of alpha that over the course of a semester add up to a modest but significant boost to our performance. Now, technical, behavioral, and fundamental analysis are all imperative to successful investing, as we have just outlined for you here today. However, there's one concept of analysis we have not yet gone over, earnings analysis. Earnings announcements can make or break a stock, so when deciding if we want to hold a company through an earnings announcement, we analyze the following metrics. To exemplify some of these metrics, we picked three different companies with three different stories. The first of which, Cadence Designs, is going to tell us the importance of earnings his history and precedence. Moving down the line to a fan favorite, Lululemon, they told us how to stick to our guns and monitor price movement 10 days prior to the earnings announcement. Finally, we'll talk about United Healthcare or UNH. Uh, this had a less favorable outcome, uh, but still the whole goal here is to garner alpha. Uh, that's the one thing all these companies have in common. So in addition to gaining alpha through our weighting scheme, the CAFE program is unique as it's one of the few programs in the country that actually encourages us to play earnings. Our active management style allows us to play the price reaction on quarterly earnings reports in order to gain quick returns like we did with CDNS. And looking at Cadence once more, we see the earnings consistency. This company has only missed earnings twice since 2008. Coming with this is an average price reaction the following day of 6% to the upside. So we started looking into Cadence Design 10 days before the earnings announcement. As we saw volume and price start to trend upwards, we bought in February 12th at 52.16 per share and maintained faith in our decision even after seeing it fall in the following two trading sessions. And it turns out this faith paid off because the company beat earnings estimates and move forward with positive price guidance. This resulted in a jump up after hours on February 19th. The following day, we came into the cafe and sold the stock for $55.59 a share. Now this garnered us an average HPY of around 6%, but also 27 basis points worth of alpha. The road to Lululemon's earnings was a bit of a different story though. We bought into Lulu in the beginning of the semester due to the unbelievable growth aspects of the company, a few of which can be seen behind me. However, due to the time of the buy-in, we found ourselves down nearly 6% on the company before they reported quarter one earnings. So when earnings season rolled around, we had to decide whether or not to hold the company. While monitoring them closely, we saw that they had higher than average price movement 10 days before earnings. But that wasn't enough information for us to make a decision. Therefore, we had to dig deeper to figure out how their earnings might play out. Similar to Cam, digging deep into earnings was one of my favorite aspects of CAFE. In doing so, we found some very convincing data. The upcoming quarter, quarter one, included holiday sales. Looking at industry projections, we saw that holiday sales were supposed to be the greatest that they have ever been in over six years. Combining these industry projections with an unprecedented growth in athleisure, we expected Lululemon to lead this charge. The street's increasingly bullish stance going into earnings only solidified our decision to hold the company. We stuck with our analysis and watched as the company gained us 14.63% through earnings. Despite conducting such a thorough analysis when playing earnings, sometimes we can still get it wrong. An example of this would be United Healthcare. We felt confident in holding UNH going into earnings, which proved to be right. They beat both earnings and revenue and even had a positive 3.5% pre-market movement. Despite these positive signs and indicators, UNH went on to lose 4% that day after reporting earnings. This really exemplifies the volatile nature and how risky earnings can be and shows just how lucky we are to have this opportunity to play earnings that many other schools do not. Now the student fund managers did just get to present six of the 11 sectors with holdings across both our growth and value funds. However, like I previously mentioned, that's not our only holdings as we are completely diversified across all sectors and industries and that can be seen on your fact sheets. The CAFE program is always trying to implement new best practices and in doing such we have taken advice from our advisory board as well as just looking to mimic industry that much more by creating our own weighted indice. With that being said, we no longer bench our performance just against the S&P 500 and competing funds, but we have now created our own weighted benchmark, which is constructed by using our specific sector weights. As some of you may know, tracking our fund's performance includes a large amount of data, tricky calculations, and a high attention to detail. 
Despite this, I found this to be one of the biggest challenges for me, but also one of the largest takeaways that I got from the CAFE program. And when creating our weighted benchmark, we ran into some trouble and with the addition of new companies, sweeping of older ones, the introduction of sector ETFs, as well as individual betas that all had to be implemented into the calculations. And unlike industry, we have to do all these calculations on a single, very large Excel file. And in order to show you the process that we undergo on a daily basis, Bob and I are going to go step by step. So before we can compare our funds to that of the market, we need to ensure that they are similar in composition. Looking behind me, you'll see that companies and industries, such as information technology and consumer discretionary, the weights vary vastly uh, than that of the market. From this, we get our weighted sector performance, which shows how the S&P 500 would have performed had it had the same weightings as our two funds. Behind me is an example from April 8th, where you can see the clear differences between the weighted sector performance. Now, all of this is calculated on a daily basis. So when we plot it on a single chart, we can see the difference between the weighted and raw performance of both of these funds. And you can, as we were talking about before, you can see that we've outperformed, we've outperformed our S&P 500, the S&P 500 benchmark with the risk-adjusted basis on a risk-adjusted basis with an alpha of 2.17% in our growth fund and 1.51% in our value fund. But what's new is we're now comparing against our weighted benchmark, which you can see we've also outperformed on a risk-adjusted basis with an alpha of 2.17% in growth, uh, with 1.32% in growth. I'm sorry and 2.55% in value. To, com to continue on with the comparisons, you can see that the betas between the two funds were also changed because we're now running our regressions against a weighted benchmark as opposed to the S&P 500. You might also notice that the tracking error is slightly higher with our new weighted benchmark, which we're looking into making improvements into the future. Now these new practices, as well as the traditional process of the cafe, is truly what the program is all about. And consistency is key and oftentimes is what drives success. I have been lucky enough to be a part of this special program for the last year now and witness all of the success as well as the ever, ever changing environment that it is as well. I can only assume and I'm confident that moving into the future, it'll continue to stay the same. We have all learned a lot as we have progressed through the CAFE program this semester. CAFE produces student fund managers who are able to comply with the process, and similar to industry, we take on a large role of responsibility and have certain expectations we must meet. As a result, we develop our integrity each and every day as we strive to meet these expectations. The CAFE has a set of moral principles that everyone acclimates to through this process. These valuable life lessons has us not only just prepared for industry, but primed for success. I would now like to take this time to highlight the international travel that myself and the rest of the group were able to participate on this past semester. During our spring break, we traveled to Montreal, Quebec, where we visited the Montreal Exchange and as, as well as presented to McGill University our practices. We are so thankful for opportunities such as this, and it wouldn't be able to be done without the generous support of our alumni, sponsors, and of course, Mr. Hans Christensen. I would now also like to invite up Mr. Garrett Palala to talk more about the international travel that the cafe has been able to do through the 15 years. Thank you. Well, although I haven't been apart for 15 years, I have for 10. Um, and I've been a big supporter of the program as well as the board and the rest of the alumni for the last 10 years. And I had the opportunity to travel to both Frankfurt, Germany, Heidelberg, uh, Dubai. So a couple of extra trips than some. Uh, but it's a huge opportunity. I think it's a huge differentiator in the program. Some universities, I think, over the last 10 to 15 years have tried to, you know, copy Doc's, you know, program and what they've been able to do, but none of them have ever been able to offer the international travel. And so if I could just ask, raise a hands of who had the opportunity to do some international travel with the program, just to show some hands. So. As you can see, I think it's a, it's a huge component of the, uh, of the program and the opportunity that the, the students get. And I would like to also thank Hans Christensen for his huge support uh, over the last you know, 10 plus years of, of the um, organization. And it's a close knit group of alumni. So as you can see, we all come back to support the program, but we also all talk on a daily or weekly, monthly basis. We get together for certain events in New York and Boston, and this is where I personally, this program was a, was a differentiator for me in getting a job uh, in the industry about 12 years ago. And I think this is an opportunity and, the, and we would ask for everyone else to continue with their support 
um, and keep with the alumni connections and, uh, and help one another out as they proceed. So, um, thank you. Thank you. And thank you all for coming today to listen to this presentation. We're so proud of our work through the entire semester. Um, and with that being said, we're going to move on to open the floor up to questions. Really great job, guys. That was incredible. I'm sure there's a huge weight off your shoulders. <laughs> um, so, you know, showing your performance, you guys did, did excellent, which was great. Um, you know, we've seen a large run up in equities and valuations are a little stretched. Can you guys talk about how you did a little bit of profit taking, maybe some trimming on some of your overweights, you know, and how you kind of manage that? Um, yeah, so we've definitely taken a lot of profits through the semester. Um, we've taken big gains in our value fund from holdings like Cisco, which we sold earlier on in the semester, and Garmin, which we sold earlier on <coughs> after earnings. Um, and also the same in our growth fund as well. We had a semiconductor marble technologies that returned us almost 20%. Um, and we're kind of adjusting more towards a you know, more risk adverse type, type fund right now especially as we've just reached our uh, all-time high. And you can definitely see that through our data as we're trying to you know, minimize risk where we can. I think also, just to give another example to you in our growth fund, uh, we're all able, we're able to use technical analysis in this program. And I just remember one of our holdings, uh, Dimeback Energy in the growth fund, was actually going through this trend. It was another profit-taking profit -taking example, like you said, but that just came to my mind because the beauty of technical, technical analysis that we just are so fortunate to use um, truly really helped us make that trade. Um, a Dutch economist a couple years back referred to the current international trading environment as globalization um, with frictions like Brexit, um, decline in multilateral trade agreements, and movement more toward bilateral uh, trade wars, tariffs. I'm wondering if anybody could comment on the international outlook and how that might affect some of your holdings. Uh, yeah, so that's actually a great question. Um, as we saw with the GDP numbers on Friday, uh, net exports were increasing at like 3.2%. Uh, so at the beginning of the semester, we were really worried about that, and we tried to stay away from countries like China and countries like um, the UK. Uh, we actually warmed up to that as some more numbers came out, as sentiment increased uh, and changed. Uh, and now we actually hold a number of countries in China and one in the UK. talk about the three-minute trade, the sweep of one company and you were able to buy another. Um, having as many analysts as you do along with a hierarchy within the cafe, can you speak to how did that process happen and how were you able to sweep something through your approval process in three minutes? Absolutely. <laughs> um, so first of all, before we do any trade, we have authorization from uh, Doc and from our MD, Janetta Griffin. Um, and for this specific trade, how it went down, we had, um, we had ran it by both of them the day before and decided that at some point during the day, if the trading was optimal, we'd execute the trade. And so I kept getting my phone blown up while I was sitting in human behavior because uh, Ed and Dean wanted to make an energy trade. So I scrambled back after class and um, we pretty much saw exactly what we showed on the screen. It was. Uh, two very strong sell signals from the holding that they wanted to exit and two very strong buy signals from the company they wanted to get into. So it was actually like relatively easy decision. It was very unique how it lined up with the timing. Usually um, once we get out of a position that's unfavorable, there's a, they always want me to just like tell them it's the right time to buy in, but I can't do that. Like I have to see some sort of signal to indicate that. So it was really nice that we were able to not be in cash um, for a long time and actually just get right back into a, uh, into a holding that was really unique. Yeah, it also helped that we were diff uh, sweeping into different industries within energy um, because we swept out of the midstream industry that that day was relatively flat and into Cabot which is more of a producer and that day they had started around midday to run a little bit more. So the fact that we were actually sweeping industries also really helped us out. Uh, so two part question. Uh, so multiple analysts, feel free. Um, take us a little bit into your process on 
how you distinguish when a company in the growth fund perhaps has, has reached a ceiling and it's time to sell. Uh, the other side of that coin being, uh, you know, when a company is, is continually going down, when do you decide to give up on it? Um, I can start with the upside and then if you want to come on the downside. Um, so uh, I think a good example that comes to my mind, um, which Dean mentioned a little bit earlier, was Garmin. Um, Garmin had a 17% jump after earnings, which then uh, drove them to be 30% um, uh, over our holding period yield. Um, and after earnings, a lot of times you'll see it go one of two ways. It either continues to um, rise over the coming weeks or it drops down and corrects over the next few days. Um, and with Garmin, we, uh, we determined that it would probably drop a little bit because we thought 17% was a little bit of an excessive price reaction. So we decided to take profits there, sell the company, and get into a different discretionary holding. Yeah, so you have the other side of that. Um, an example of this would be United Healthcare. So we held United Healthcare in our value fund this semester. Um, we saw them fall about 8 to 10% over the course of two weeks. Then you had earnings. Uh, as I talked about before, we were pretty confident going to earnings. They did beat. Um, but based on the behaviorals that were going on at the time with the managed care for all that was discussed about, um, the CEO commented on it, and it was just a large impact from behavioral driving them downwards. We didn't feel that it was um, really worthwhile being in them anymore. Um, we had viable options elsewhere, so we got out of UNH. We feel like it was a falling knife, um, and that proved to be correct as they started to continue to decline. And I think also heading towards elections, you're also going to see uh, massive amounts of behaviorals to continue to drive down the managed care sector. So I think we made the right choice there, getting out of UNH. I would also really quickly like to add on to the fact that like these students are constantly, as all the alumni know, um, in the room and monitoring all of the holdings at every time of the day that the market's open. So with that being said, I mean, they get the phone call from Doc in the morning, like, are we under outperforming? What's down? What's driving the fund down? And is it underperforming? It's competitors, the sector, yada, 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 and the list goes on. So they're very well aware of what has been trending to be outperforming and more importantly what's been underperforming and we know when we need to like be more boisterous and get out of that position. And we constantly have a buy list ready to go. <laughs> okay. I'd love to hear the opinion on maybe the diminishing effects of the tax law changes that went into sort of boost corporate profits and earnings. We've had a relatively long you know, bull market and a great run in 2017 leading up to the law being passed, and then last year got choppy in the last quarter. Uh, but what is your, you know, what would you warn the next group that comes in over the next year or two where that uh, sort of diminishing bump uh, would go away from the, the new tax changes? Yeah, um, that's a great question. Uh, so you mentioned that the benefits of that boost from fiscal policy is diminishing, and that's absolutely true. Um, but what we are also seeing is that the sentiment um, from that, the business sentiment of that more business favorable policy has continued to extend. So as a warning to the next group who's uh, standing in the back and on the side, um, I would say that don't count on uh, tax cuts to continue to boost uh, U.S. real GDP going forward. Um, but I think that the business sentiment, um, the positive business sentiment is still going to be there moving. First off, really well done. Um, collectively, what was your favorite part of traveling in Montreal? Mm. 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 Um. The Derivatives Exchange. Yeah, I really like going to the Derivatives Exchange. It was really cool, like being in the building, being in the environment, uh, being around like, you know, professionals that have done this for years. On the other hand, McGill was kind of cool because we got to see that they asked their questions during the presentation. So Doc said maybe four words, and he just got lit up by about 10 kids raising their hands. <laughs> and the rest of us maybe got to say five words before they just told this kid to stop talking. <laughs> just the bonding experience was pretty great, too. I mean, um, I've now had the opportunity to do it with two different groups, and it's just the memories that you make there are really cool, and it's something that you'll definitely carry on with you forever. I'm sure you guys. Yeah, I can honestly say I'd never been in a rooftop hot, uh, hot tub yeah. before, so that was my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no one's going to say it. I enjoyed the snowmobiling. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was waiting for that.
Well, that was a great job, and you beat me to uh, inviting you all to give them a big hand because there's a lot of preparation that goes into this, and as you might imagine, rehearsals and um, a lot of time and effort. So great job, guys. Really terrific. Really good presentation and lots of insights for us. And I'd also uh, just like to reiterate our thanks to the alumni for joining us for this very special event that takes place at the end of every semester. And also to those of you who have so generously contributed to the Campaign for CAFE, which has been underway now for a couple of years. When we first ventured into this space in terms of trying to initiate a special campaign to provide funding for the special activities of the uh, CAFE program, we weren't sure actually what we were getting into or what kind of response we were going to get. And the response has been overwhelmingly positive, and we hope to keep this going because it really does help to keep the CAFE the very special program that it is. And I'd also like to join with the others who have thanked um, Hans Christensen, who has been a real uh, support, supporter and sponsor of a number of the cafe activities, especially the international travel. Uh, if any of you um, wish to visit the cafe space while you're here and you haven't been there, especially parents, I think alumni have visited it, but you'll see around the room are all the pictures from all of the international trips, and those trips just wouldn't have been made possible without the support of Mr. Christensen. And uh, we really appreciate all of his generosity and his support for the program. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, Mario Gabelli, who has been a consistent supporter of the program over many years, I think since its inception. He had a little something to do with that, as I recall. I wasn't here, but I've heard lots of stories about those things. So I'd like to thank Mario uh, for all of his support for the, the CAFE program and for the school that bears his name. And I'd also like to acknowledge Dr. Michael Melton, who founded the program, uh, who was a pioneer in so many ways and still is. You've, you've heard about the different in this program as compared to other university programs. It's very different from the other business schools which, with which I've been affiliated, which have all been good business schools, but this program is unique and distinct in so many ways uh, because the students are really managing the money in real time. They're making the decisions. You've heard about how they actually execute the trades, and they have to live with the consequences, and usually they're pretty positive consequences, so we're glad of that. Um, it's also very different because of the international travel that the students participate in. Um, I know that the students had uh, traveled to uh, Tokyo earlier this year. I, as the dean, I worry a lot about how our students are going to survive a 14 and a half hour flight to Narita, but nobody seemed the worse for wear. And uh, everybody um, had a great educational and cultural experience. And that's really what we're all about in terms of our emphasis on experiential education, helping students to learn what it's like to practice uh, what, they're, or what they're learning in the classroom in a real world environment. And the fact that they can do that without leaving our building uh, is pretty super. And uh, the fact that they can travel abroad and present their ideas and their research and um, their strategies to other schools and to practitioners around the world is also a pretty exciting thing. So I thank you all for being with us. I wonder if we could um, close by giving our students one more round of applause for that terrific presentation. reception set up, I hope, outside <laughs> for you. I hope you'll stick around and talk with the students and visit with the alumni and spend a little, a little more time with us this afternoon. So thank you all for being here. And uh, to the parents of the seniors who are here, um, I guess we will see you in not so, long, uh, not so long from now at commencement on May 18th. So we'll look forward to seeing you there. Thanks, everybody, and enjoy the rest of your day and your week.